The opinions expressed in the following podcast are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or on any specific security or investment product. It is only intended to provide education and entertainment about the financial industry and the stock market. Enjoy. On this episode of Pennies Going In Raw, we interview Oh Hey Tommy. Hey yo, check one two. This is Flavor Flav in the building for the Atlas crew. Atlas trading, what the f*** is up? They're traders, they're prodigies, and then there's legends. Rob, 4% baby. No way. 4 fucking percent. Buy the fucking dip. Hey, who told me about Ibex? Like, dude, what the fuck? Like, someone just made, like, a lot more money than me on my trade. You find out life's this game of pennies. Did you check the portfolio? Pennies. 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 The margin for error is so small. I bet Warren Buffett never did that. And they out there making money right now off of penny stocks. The two guys is putting in work to make y'all rich. The pennies we need are everywhere around us. Time to think big. Pennies going in raw. Featuring Dan, Deity at Dips, and Hugh Honey. Produced by Vinny Strokes, baby. And today's episode of Pennies Going In Raw is brought to you by Benzinga. Benzinga is our absolute favorite resource to use to trade with. We use it for charts and news and scanners. Look, guys, we use it for everything except for buying and selling stocks. I mean, that's all there is to it. And if you're not using Benzinga Pro, which you can get for two weeks free at pro.benzinga.com. That's pro.benzinga.com. You should at least be checking out their YouTube channel every single day, youtube.com forward slash Benzinga. They have hot stocks, Luke, and a just plethora of fantastic guests from me and Hugh to Mia Khalifa to Ripster to CEOs of companies to CEOs of Weeble. They have it all, guys. Make sure you check it out. That's youtube.com forward slash Benzinga. And today we have on ex-DJ, uh, brand new Furu, Oh Hey Tommy, uh, Tommy Coops, Half a Breathe Carolina. We had him on around episode six or so with him and his partner, Dave, music partner, of course. And it's it's been uphill from there um i remember back then your account was at 70 it's now over half a million and you're you're doing great you've developed a strategy on your own and i think kind of picking up where we left off last time i think your way of starting i think you mentioned you know you were just music had stopped couldn't do shows you gotta learn how to trade you hopped in just like the rest of the corona bill yeah that was, I mean, that was it. I, I mean, I became better friends with you guys. I think when we met you on the thing, we like had, that was like our first. Yeah, yeah, that was our first time talking, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just got super like involved in the community and trading. And I'm just one of those people that like, I don't do anything unless I do it like 500%. I just, I don't see the point in doing it. So I just got like way too obsessed with it. And uh, here we are. Now we're doing this. So at first you were kind of just taking all the Twitter calls. They're all going 100 to 500%. Then it kind of transitions to slower market. A lot of people that did the same thing had issues. They, you know, they their swings just got destroyed. A lot of their stocks in their portfolios went down like 50%. How did you kind of avoid that and then kind of come on the strategy of this technical analysis guru that you are today? Yeah, well, I mean, no, nah, I'm just uh, so I, I really just I just I stopped sw- I stopped swinging because I was just I just found myself and I talked to you on voice like all day every day, so you kind of were doing the same thing I was where I was just like I was I was doing swings, but I don't know if I'm just not good at swing trading or if my emotions get the best of me or what it is. That- but yeah, uh, I was just I was I'd be up I'd be up like twenty percent one day and then <clears throat> sorry the next day. I'd just be down again. So I just kept breaking even. Like I, I would just hit this wall in my account where I just like couldn't get through it. And I was like, all right, I'm sick of like, 
I was like, I know how to day trade. I'm doing it to like stay green on the days where my swings are red. So I'm just going to try yeah. just, just doing that and having no swings. And I'm not saying I foresaw the market crashing when it did, but it happened like right after I went full cash and then, uh, and then everything kind of went down for everybody else. And I was just scalping like two or three good things a day. And I've had like, I've legit had over 10 K days almost every single day since January. All right, was that a plan by you two going cash together? Um, I don't know. Did we talk about doing it? I, I don't know if we like, we talk uh, all day, every day. I so remember, it might've just been like, I, even a past, like a month ago's episode on the podcast, I'd mentioned like, I just decided to go full cash. So it just seemed like a market where you were just daggering plays. You're going in and out, just scalping them really quick and not even holding them for very long at all. <clears throat> and I was in that same boat where I said, all my swings are dropping and I am essentially just day trading to make up for losses that my swings were bringing to my account. So I think we both agreed that, you know, this market's shaky. All of our swings, which were, you know, UWMC, lots, et cetera, et cetera, we're all just going down every day. <clears throat> we saw them in the single digits and we said, hey, I think uh, it's time to cut. We cut and um, it just happened to be at the right time where the next week the swings were just obliterated like another 25, 50%. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm hearing that algos may turn on soon. So, you know, ideally, I mean, today I came to the market and I think the biggest runner that I saw was Fun, P H U N. It was up 30%. And then there was that BTX that was up. It had one million float, and it was up stupid on uh, on nothing. Um, but ideally, when the algos turn back on, we start to see those few hundred percent runners coming back and uh, you know holding their gains into open and not just like that straight down or like that quick pop and then kill candle. And that would be, I mean, that would be awesome to to see. I mean, you're killing it. You know, you just said that uh, that you've been having over ten thousand dollar days ever since. That's insane especially in this market what do you kind of attribute because i mean you've kind of switched to being a twitter personality as well you activated your second account you're no longer just on breathe carolina you're now oh hey tommy as well um it seems like you started doing twitter and your gains were they always looking like that or was that just like hey man i'm killing it now i'm gonna start posting them on twitter yeah so i think they were like <laughs> They were kind of looking like that, but they were, again, I was getting kind of like screwed by the swings that I was in. So like, I, I don't even know what I was doing day trading because I was just trying to keep my head above water and stay green. So then when I switched to just cash starting every day at zero, it just gave me like a new mentality where every day I was at zero and I was just like, all right, I'm just going to trade the setups that I see that are the, that are the best. And I'm going to trade them with like very little emotion. So like right now, something like eyes that I just traded I just find levels that I like of support. And then I find like a level that I think everybody would sell at, whether that be VWAP or the 90 EMA or the 20 EMA or whatever it is. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like I can play it with size from this support and I can sell it at VWAP. And that's like an okay trade for me. And I'll find another one and I'll find 10 a day. And I'll that's just another make thing that's been super impressive to me is how fast, because it seems like just two months ago, it was okay. This seems like a good place to add to now it's all technical analysis. I know you attribute a lot of it to Gary and other people in Atlas, like SD in the Momo room. But I mean, aside from those, your growth in technical analysis and just stock jargon in general just seems to have exponentially grown in the past couple months. W was that just like you in the Momo chat or um, scalp floor, et cetera, just going over it? <laughs> they put me on there to like, to like write a hype speech every day. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to like, I see some stuff that's working. I'm just going to like say stuff. And then it kind of forced me to like really look at every play because I don't want to say anything on there and have people get screwed and look like a, like a D bag. So like, I just, I wait for things to form really good support and that's where I'll take them. And I'm also playing our, as our accounts have gotten bigger, like I'm sure you guys do, you start playing with way more size. Like where I used to play with $1,000, I'm now playing with like a hundred or $200,000. So I don't want to just, I'm not just like adding something there just because like, I think it might be good. Like I have to actually uh, <coughs> sorry, believe in it. So yeah, just, I, I think as my account grew, it forced my skills to grow. And I don't want to like, just get lucky anymore. Like I want it to be something that I'm, I'm like really good at. Yeah, but you're definitely developing like that sixth sense or like that yeah. kind of like feeling. Because uh, 
you're not just, you know, you take 10, 20 trades a day, but half, I mean, at least from what I watch of you, you know, it seems like you're really developing like that. Okay. Like I know that this, this personality of this stock has run before, or like, for instance, like when the NFTs were running, you know, I know that we liked Genus a lot because that was one of your first real gains, right? Yeah. Dude, my first big trade was Genus. It was waking up and it was like at 11. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know why. That is awesome. <laughs> but yeah, it really feels like you're really uh, getting like that personality of the stocks and really understanding, you know, which ones move or like which ones are just garbage, you know, and, and that's something that's really hard to pick up on when you're when you're a new trader is understanding that, OK, it, news on this stock can move this stock. But news, the same news on a different stock will do absolutely nothing. Yeah. And I think also it's just like you watch things move. All, like so many people have asked me now that I started posting uh, gains, like friends, other DJs, whatever. They're all like, oh, dude, just like, like, tell me what to do or this and that. I'm like, it's not like that. Like, you can learn support resistance. You can learn yeah. volume. You can learn those things. But until you've stared at the screen, I mean, now it's been almost two years for like 13 hours a day. Like you're not gonna have that like it's emotionless like, um, thing yeah. where you're, you're it, like imagine, right now. Look at yeah. eyes right now. I knew it was gonna do that, and there's no reason I should have known that. I just know that it knifed and that it formed support, and I was like, it has a lot of volume, and I just believe that it will go. And now it's going, and it, I think you just get that from staring at them for so long. One of the one of the things that I've always thought is like, if someone says, just tell me when to buy or what to buy, when to sell, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's kind of like going in the hardest level of video game and then just saying like tell me what buttons well i'm having to tell you to press left right a b c d as shit is happening i'm also having to do it i can't do both and and there's so many different things changing so many so i can tell you how to do a kickflip on a skateboard yeah you slide yeah. your foot up you pop it you land it. just because i'm saying that to you doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do it you have to sit outside and try to do it for Hours and hours until you, you gotta get a couple skint knees before you can land that that kickflip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and there's so many different outside variables which are just, especially right now, affecting the market. It's insane the the adaptability that we've seen. At least when I started trading, we would go through market cycles, uh, especially inside the small caps world, and you would see volume die out on certain months. Now we're seeing like a weekly rotation, uh, which is for someone, you know, he's been a little bit longer is just blowing my mind because you could get used to something for months at a time. Now it's like, it flips on a dime. Well, dude, every day is like different. Like we'll, we'll yeah. have one day where there's like 10 runners. We'll wake up the next day and the biggest gainer is like 20%. It's like, it's okay, stressing me out. I'm, I'm getting old. You see the grays? Yeah. yeah look how old you are. I mean, what are you 40, 45 now? Yeah. Just about <laughs> You're coming up on it. As a as a day trader that's uh you know kind of waking up, you said you used to like have all this money in swings, which I I bet was a huge mental thing, especially being on the West Coast. You're basically waking up at where most people would be waking up like one o'clock in the morning, two in the morning. You know, like if you sleep in and you look at your phone and it's seven a.m., you no longer freaking out because it's all good. Are there days that you just take off now that you don't have any money in the markets is just look not look right for trading to you um there hasn't been yet um the other day thursday of last week because it was like the long weekend i had like yeah. a really good morning i traded like two things and i was like all right like i think i made like 16 grand and like any other day i would have been like oh okay well i could probably turn this 16 into like 30 but i was just like that's like enough it's thursday it's a long weekend the market's probably going to slow down uh, so I just like called it a day, like right there. I haven't had a day where I just don't trade yet, but I'm sure that that day will come. When you're looking for these plays, what what's I know a lot of people always ask, like, what is the favorite setup indicator? What do you kind of use to find these like ears? Um, yeah. So for me, my favorite thing is to check like the top 10 gainers in the morning. I put them on a watch list on I use Weeble for my scalp account. So I put them on a watch list of Weeble and I just start sifting through them all through the open, seeing I like the 9 EMA, 20 EMA, 50 EMA, and the 50 SMA. Um, and I'll just start seeing what comes down to there out of the runners. And I'll start scaling in on something that I think had either the best news or the best. It's like the best. There's also like ones that are like the best name, like today, fun. Like everybody knows that name. So when they see it and they see the news, they're like, oh, I've made money on this before. Like I'll buy it. So I start looking at you know things like that and I'll start scaling in. 
how are you scaling into these day trades and do you ever like <clears throat> and how do you how do you manage your risk on a lot of them so my favorite thing usually is all like my first scale in will be at the 9 ema if i get it at the 20 ema if it falls down to there i'll like get a lot more and if it comes down to like the 50 i'll like it'll be like a full position which is like 200 grand 250 grand what, uh, what in what in comparison is that to your account uh my account's at like a little over half a mil so nice so but like i only trade more so. you're you're having like full conviction putting in half your account into a day trade like i like i'm asking again risk management on that what is what is your strategy of if this just does not go my way where do i cut it um, I'll cut so like on a fifty. If I add on the fifty uh, SMA, that to me is like the last like line of resistance. Essentially, like if it breaks that, like uh, if it really breaks it, like I'll just cut it. Obviously, I don't know how hard the knife will hit, so I can't say like if it goes down two percent or it goes down, whatever. So it, I just see those key levels that I see are like a good support, and if it really breaks those things, and I have that much in it, then I'll I'll cut it. I won't like I won't add too much down, but that's why I like to scale in. You know, whether it be the nine EMA down to the 20, down to the 50, or like yeah. support levels. I never like, I'm never like, this looks good, throwing half the account in it right here. Like it, it would have to be like a scale in. For that, that is the nice right. thing though about taking commons and not options is that, you know, you kind of, even if you are going heavy, okay, you know, let's say that something's up 200%. If it's moving wow. that much volume, very worst case scenario, let's say like you oversize, you over position and it halts down on, on an offering or something, you're probably looking at like worst case scenario, maybe let's call it like 20% of your account. But uh, I would say like maybe, you know, median loss is probably anywhere from like five to 7%, you know, if it's a really bad knife. So that's really like, uh, you know, for everyone that's thinking like, okay, Tommy, Tommy is no risk because he's just going in heavy on his accounts. Um, that's the real benefit is that, you know, he has a plan. So even though he's kind of leveraging himself, um, you know, most brokers give five to one leverage. So it, so you're really using that to your advantage, um, which I think is awesome. And I, and I really only get stuff <laughs> that's down what I consider down on the day. Like I'm not yeah. buying stuff. That's like, five green candles in a row. Like I just won't do it. Like I'm waiting for I'm waiting for something that was hot. People kind of forgot about it for a second. I'll add it and that's like where I think it'll test VWAP, it'll test whatever. And my plays are short. Like if I'm adding at the 9 EMA, like my and in VWAP's like one nice green candle away from it, like that's my that's my move. That's what I'm So so to be clear, you're you're basically saying that you're just a full out day trading range trader. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. That's we, t- we had an episode about that maybe like three weeks ago, and that's all we talked about. And and it's awesome because I don't think we've really had Rocky catching Bob is for sure. Yeah, but that's what I was literally about to say. We've never had like just a pure day trade. I mean, we've had Gary, we've had PJ, but I feel like you know during a choppy market, obviously, I think this help will help a lot of the newer ones. And that's why I have a lot of kind of specific questions that I think a lot of people that want a day trade want to know, kind of like. Would you ever hold things overnight? Like, let's say you buy something towards the end of the day, it still looks decent. After hours, it gets kind of spready. If you're selling it, then you're selling for like a three percent loss just because it was a lower float, and yeah, you, you know that that shit happens. Do you hold overnight ever on these stocks? Do you like what? Not much. I I uh the other day IDRA was down like I think like sixty percent, seventy percent in after hours. I literally was just had it on my screen. And here, uh, after hours closes at 5 p.m. So I just had it on my screen and I was like, if it stays this low, like 70% down in after hours, I'm just going to load it and overnight it because I don't think, like my risk reward was, I, I doubt it's going to go much lower. And I think it'll probably wake up like worst case, like best case scenario, 5%, 10% up. Um, so I waited till like 4.59 and I bought like 100 grand of it. And I was like, I'm just going to go to sleep and I have Weeble so I could wake up at 1 a.m. So I woke up at 1 a.m. and it gapped up like 20% at 1 a.m. So I just woke up to 20 grand and sold it at 1 a.m. and just went back to bed. So like those scenarios where I think it's like, oh, something fell down on whatever data and it's like so far down that I think it literally can't go more down all overnight. But for the most part, I'm not I'm not big on overnighting right now anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's cool because like we were talking about Rocky catching Bob, you know, he's pretty intraday, but it sounds like you just have a plan. You know, if even if it looks like it's going to break VWAP, you're scaling, you know, yeah. 90% of your position, which I think is awesome because that's one of those things, especially 
uh, I know with me where it's like one of those things where it's like, okay, like this thing has nice volume. This thing's breaking view, view up, you know, uh, like that candle is super sick. And all of a sudden it knifes on me. And I'm like, if I just stuck to my plan, th- it would have been a beautiful trade. So I think yeah. that that's, that's cool. That's really awesome. And sometimes my plan is like new high of day. Sometimes my plan mm-hmm. is pre-market high. Like whatever I think it's going to do is what, you know, I'll do. But also if I like say it, if I, if I'll call something, on the Momo floor, I always say like where I think it's going. So yeah. at that point, it's like, I've told you what I'm going to do. You decide what to do kind of after that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like one of those, like, uh, it's kind of like, you know, every penny counts, every penny counts, you know, you don't need. So it's funny because I'm the almost exact opposite. And we talked about on Sunday was that, you know, I make my quarter sometimes in one day, one week where you're you know, consistently building, 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 you know, every penny counts. That that's that's a cool perspective. Yeah. Like the way I looked at it, I was like, if I could log onto my computer, make 10 to 20 grand a day, and then just have no risk when I go to sleep and just wake up and do that again. And obviously as my account gets bigger to like a million, two million, whatever, that number will go up. But that's just how I look at it. Like I log in, make 20 grand, then go to bed with zero risk, wake up, do it again. And some days that won't happen. Some days it'll be down five grand, 10 grand. But as long as I'm consistently winning more than I'm losing, then my yeah. account will keep growing. What are some of your biggest losses? Like when did they happen? How'd they happen? I'll tell you guys right now. I, oh yeah, that's a cool feature on Webull. Yeah, I like that one a lot. I mean, you have cost basis on TD Ameritrade. You can look it up through there too. Um, my biggest loss was ATNF, and it was for ten grand. Oh, um, I remember that one. OCUP yesterday actually for uh seven grand yeah um so, but yeah so, I mean, like, nothing over 10 grand loss yeah you you keep them like i was actually just saying this on the last episode is how i had my two biggest red days and they were my biggest red days since august like my which was my third biggest red day which is crazy because i was like this should have happened because my account is five six seven x since then so I think obviously risk management is, is super important uh, when it comes to your strategy as well. Kind of transitioning into like music and numbers. What percentage of shows was like your in, like how much were you missing out on income when coronavirus started whenever the show stopped? Ninety eight percent. Like ninety eight percent. You're getting your Spotify's and what your if the Savages CD sells at Target or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it, only the Savage CD though. Yeah, only that one. No, yeah, like we have we have like our monster deal is good. That could like keep me afloat. Um, you know, like yeah, keep royalties. Me afloat. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got a I got a new publishing deal right when uh this kind of started, so that was like an extra like 150 grand. So, so I'm <laughs> really good at like making money uh like other than shows, but shows is like if I want to like buy a Ferrari if I, I want to like live yeah. my life the way I live my life yeah I, I, I need to play show keep so me afloat 300 grand <laughs> yeah so, so it's, it's kind of like the concerts where your your main jobs and all this stuff was kind of your side job you kind of like you know I think everyone needs to have at least one other form of income uh than you know what their main thing is whether it be trading and then something else but uh so essentially, because I know a lot of people be like, oh, well, it didn't really matter to him. He was, you know, he's mu- musicians, super rich. I mean, you put. I, so, I mean, where, where like were you like, OK, this is more than just a hobby. I don't know what you're making, making music, but twenty thousand dollars a day, ten thousand dollars a day is is very impressive. It's over two million a year. Um. W- where do you realize that this wasn't just a hobby? Like, was this recent? No, I think like, I mean, probably right after we talked to you guys, right? Like I had taken an interest in it. I had, you know, I was like swinging, whatever. And then, and then the more and more I got involved in, in the community and being friends with all you guys and realizing that like, okay, I can do music like at one, like, cause uh, we, a market closes here at one. So I was like, all right, I can do music at 1 PM and like be fine. I'm not doing music like 6 a.m. here. So I was like, all right, I'll just wake up. I'm going to trade every single day and like learn this skill that I could have. Because I I mean, I don't want to tour till I'm like 60. So it's something that like, if I can have this in my back pocket forever and do this and tour, when touring is over, this can just be something that I can do. If you're making six figures a week, 
would you still tour? Yeah, yeah, I'll still tour. Whoa, I, whoa, I, whoa. I, I, I tour because we can can tour and go. It's sick to get paid yes, to go all over right. the world. Dan, can we tweet that Breathe Carolina Tommy is has considered retirement? Is that a is that breaking news? We'll uh, yeah, sell consider it retirement like at, at fifty. ED, ED, edm.com is gonna fucking love this, dude. dude I, have the, I have the new. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I talk to Dave about it all the time because we we have conversations now where we're kind of like, well, I mean, if we can trade like this, like we can just we can be more selective too. Like we don't need to we don't need to take the show in Thunder Bay, Canada. You know, like we can pass. We'll just. I'll, I'd rather stay home Ooh. and trade that day. I got shout out, shout out Thunder Bay. I'll go there for vacation. I'll go there for vacation, but I'm not trying to play a show there. Uh, Uh, Yeah, I I think it just makes us more selective. (laughs) Uh, Since you brought up Schmitty, Dave, uh, Dave and I have talked about Roth IRAs in 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 depth. Weird Uh, that you guys talk. I didn't know you guys talked at all. I thought I was like your friend. uh, No, dude, actually, you. Schmitty, didn't you hear that reference? That that yeah, guy no. was that was telling you that like him and I are like you know like that. It's weird. Um, he didn't know your name. He, it's weird. He didn't know your real name till recently. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think in Orlando didn't he go? Wait, his name's not Hugh. <laughs> dude, what the fuck, Dave? Hey, that's this, your friend, dude. That's your friend. This is such Schmitty. It's okay, Dan, Dan. Dan Dan's one of my best friends in the whole world, and I would consider him my better friend within this your guys' thing. I'm just all right. Well, I'd consider Schmitty and I. Schmitty and I are like, dude, all right. He was just kidding with you. All right. <laughs> Tell him, Schmitty, damn it. <laughs> so, what were you guys talking about, Ross? Yeah. So, we, in depth, you know, over our many conversations just last night, uh, we were talking about Ross. And the question came up do, you know, he trades in his Roth. Do you, Tommy, trade in your Roth? No. And he doesn't trade in his Roth. He has a guy. Who trades his Roth? What he does fuck, not trade. Schmitty, Schmitty, you either misunderstood Schmitty or Schmitty was trying to sound cool. I, like I don't, Dave. I don't, I don't think Dave is Schmitty. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he trades his Roth personally. He trades every day, but he doesn't trade his his Roth. I think he he has a guy that that does it. I don't have a Roth. What I'll be honest. Fuck? I don't have it yet. I don't have it yet. But we let need me that tell money you why. now. Let me tell you why. I have investments. I'm buying. A salon. I have online retail businesses. I have my money working for me in other ways. I also need a Roth. I agree. Let's get it started. I yeah. like how you you worded those. You're you're buying your wife a salon, and you sell and you sell joggers. I, it makes money. <laughs> yeah, they make money. Yeah. Well, actually, okay. So I do <laughs> want to touch on that. You know, everybody knows you as this, you know, you're wearing Rolexes, you know, you got the billboards in the back, you know, you got a sick trading setup, you got, you drive the Jag, you know, everybody knows you as Why this. are you such a douchebag? <laughs> you know, I, I do want to touch on the fact that you, <laughs> the double- Hey, for any, for anyone not watching, he's got two Rolexes on right now. I do want to touch on the fact that um, you know, you do have side hustles and side incomes and how important that is to you. Because I, I think if a lot of us come to the market and it's like, okay, if we can make a thousand dollars a day, what else do I need to do? Um, but can you touch on that? Because even before trading, you were doing these side hustles. Yeah. So this goes back to the story that me and Dan always talk about. My dad was deported. Um, <laughs> oh God. Oh God. <laughs> I've was- never heard this. So when I, I was, thought this was a joke when you first told me that. I no, I was dead, like I'm dead serious. To me. My dad was deported. So I've literally been hustling to survive since I was 16 years old. Like had zero dollars, had to figure out how I was going to eat since I was 16. So that's just always been my mentality is like, I'm just going to work as hard as possible and make as much as possible while I can. And my mom has, my mom is like not rich, but my mom is well off and she still works like four jobs. My dad, at one point, was super rich. Still woke up at 5 in the morning every day. Didn't come home till 10 p.m. It's just like what they instilled in me. So I, I, I just, I'm just i good at the internet. I'm good at marketing. I'm good at that kind of stuff. So I was like, okay, I could probably have online retail stores that like run themselves like drop shipping stores. So I have like two or three of those. My wife is an amazing esthetician. She was like, my salon's for sale. I was like, okay, let me see the numbers. The numbers looked good. I, you know, We're buying that. And I've always, I've always just been side hustling and and doing stuff and making money in other ways, 
whether that's mixing stuff for other people, recording people. Residual income, bitch. Yeah. I mean, dude, I learned how to produce because I told kids I could produce their bands and I had zero idea how to do it. But I make just it figured you it make out. It, baby. Yeah, I just figured it out on the plot. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. That wow. Is, yeah, that's definitely one way to do it. <laughs> Hey babe, <laughs> you're going from uh, you're going from stylist to management. Hand to the keys. <laughs> that, what a day that must have been, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's just I've just always been. I think you guys are like that too. Like obviously, like you do this podcast, you trade, you you want other businesses, you want other things. It's it's something that I think successful people just have inside of them that we're just like nothing is ever enough. You're always chasing more. You're, all, you're not. It's not greedy in a sense. You just kind of wake up every day and you're like. I, instead of sleeping an extra hour, like I could go, I could do something to make money. Yeah. Ain't got shit else to do, but chase a bag. Yeah. But, yeah. And at some point it, it gets, that was Molly like, Crew that said that, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, yeah. I think I read it in Corinthians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think at some point it gets to be like bigger than the money. You know, it's almost like, it's almost like, okay, like the money's sick, but like now, you know, I mean, even all three of us are getting to a point to where like, if we really, really wanted to, you know, we could, you know, go to an Island and, you know, be fine forever. But, uh, you know, I think that, yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I think it, I think it at a certain point, it's almost like just like a drive that like, you know, not even that you want the next one in money terms, like net worth, but just like you want the next thing to be good. And you want like, I mean, look at Elon, uh, like Elon Musk, like he could have stopped when he sold, paypal like but he yeah. was just like uh no i'll just invest all of this into tesla and then i'll invest all of that into spacex and i'm gonna dr- drill tunnels under la and I, he doesn't have to do any of that and he's not doing it for the money because he's he's yeah. fine yeah, yeah. Like, like once you, once you once you make 200 million or like i think he made 100 million off of selling paypal he's good he looked like a pretty simple nerd would have been cool but instead he said screw it i'm going to Mars. exactly yeah. got well, hair plugs and started building uh it's crazy because a lot of people think that like that like the way that he's the you know so rich right now is just based on his comp plan but that's because he put every single dollar that he had into Tesla making him obviously the the largest majority shareholder buyer yeah i read i read that he put his entire paypal buyout into starting tesla and borrowed money from his parents yeah. to pay rent like that month yeah. or something something crazy yeah no he started tesla and Sp- like SpaceX and Tesla were both, I think, going bankrupt in 2008 at the same time. And he was like, I can either save one or maybe make it out alive and take some money. And he's like, screw it. I'm putting half and half in. And now he's got what, like leading car company and first people to Mars. Do you guys have you guys have on your podcast? I would say the guy who had the call of the day. I called RMO today at eight. I was just watching it. Yeah. And it's at 12, 15. Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Maybe I'll short it later. Yeah, short it later. I'll be out of that time to short it. But amazing play. No, that's awesome. Yeah. It, it, but going back to what we were talking about, I mean, it's even like, uh, do you guys know who Ray Dalio is? He he heads uh, Bridgewater Associates. All right. That's the, the girl on TikTok, Charlie Dalio. Exactly. Exactly. She- <laughs> Yeah, he he <laughs> basically like created his own market, like his own bond market. Like dude dude is just insane. Like economist like out the ass. Like he he's incredible. I really looked up to him. His principles book is amazing. Um really changed my mindset. But him after creating the bond market, he was worth like a hell of a lot of money and he didn't adapt to the market in front of him. And uh he actually ended up having three kids and a wife or two kids and a wife and asking his father for rent inside the eighties after all of this success being at the top. And then, uh, he had to ask his father and now he's worth 20 billion, something like that. So I think it's just so cool. Like all the different stories that, that, that are out there, you know? Yeah. Nobody's dad was deported and he became a millionaire. <laughs> yeah. No one's dad. And then the, yeah. Number one hits. It's all there. Um, well, I think that's all that's all we got. Um, aside from the fact that, you know, your shows are coming back. You got two this week. You got one in Chicago. You got one in Houston, Texas that we all of us will be attending. Yeah, uh, well, I'm super worried. I, I don't know how it's going to be. Uh, but but it's going to be amazing. The promoter, I sent Dan a screenshot from the promoter saying that it was on track to be great. So it's not my fault if it's not fun. Uh, but it, yeah. right, promoter's fault. Promoter's fault. Yeah, I know my worth. All right, man. Well, 
Yeah, no, you, you, you kill a show. I mean, if, if it's not lit, it's not your fault. Cause you definitely did as much as you could. No doubt. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so we will let you get back to trading. I know it's probably like breakfast time there in LA right now. Um, so thank you for joining us, man. Uh, thank you for all the good calls you're putting out on Twitter and everything you're doing for the community. Really appreciate it. And we will see you in particular in a couple days. And yeah. Schmitty. And Schmitty. <laughs> All right, guys. And thank Schmitty. you for having me. <laughs> Peace, brother. All right, man. Take care. All right, guys. That's it for Pennies Going and Raw this episode. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. If you guys did enjoy this or any of our other episodes, please give us those five stars. It helps us out a lot. Our next goal is to get 5,000 reviews. Isn't that crazy? I feel like we were just at 500. So thank you guys. Like, comment, tell us what you didn't like, and uh, tell us how we can make this better or what you loved. Thank you guys. See you next week.